the, uh, the our, our theme, as you as you will have seen, uh, is faith in history, time, narrative, history, apocalypse. Um, these scriptural traditions that we study are sort of shot through from the beginning with concerns about time and history. Um, but also we're concerned about, as scholars of these traditions, we're concerned about how we tell the story. And so the intent of this conference was to gather people to think about these questions um, in, in uh, interrelated ways, right? What's the task of historiography and how do we think about that? But also, how are time and history factoring into the very texts and figures and ideas and rituals and practices that we are that we are studying. So we're, we're at this great point of convergence here. And with that in mind, it is my honor to introduce a scholar of great renown to you this afternoon. Jillian Clark is Professor Emerita and Senior Research Fellow at the University of Bristol, and she's a fellow of the British Academy. She received all her degrees, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate from the University of Oxford. And before Bristol, she taught at the universities of Glasgow, St. Andrews, Manchester, and Liverpool. Her main publications in social and intellectual history have established her as one of the pillar figures of a generation of scholars who together really created the area of studies in late antiquity. Her books, in Late Antiquity, 1993, and Christianity and Roman Society in 2004, give ample witness to her place in the field. Some of her more recent works include a monograph on St. Monica, Monica and Ordinary Saint, uh, OUP 2015. Late Antiquity, a very short introduction from OUP in 2011. And an excellent perioral collection of several of her papers gathered under the title Body and Gender, Soul and Reason in Late Antiquity. Some may not know and be interested to know that she is married to Stephen R. L. Clark, the esteemed classical philosopher, a power couple if there ever was. <laughs> I feel quite fortunate to have had this opportunity to meet Professor Clark, to my recollection, I think we have not met before. I've seen you across the room when you came to Villanova before. Um, but over a year ago, as I was musing on the ideas floating around for the next PMR conference, I was thinking history, historiography, and um, I happened to be musing about them in the presence of our mutual friend, David Hunter, now at Boston College. Uh, and I was saying, so who? Uh, maybe a connection to Augustine. What, who should I do? And David immediately said, well, General Clark. And as soon as he said it, I knew he was right. Uh, David had hoped to attend the PMR, as he had many times before, but other commitments called him away, and so Jillian, he asked me to extend his personal regrets that he couldn't be here. Well, without further ado, then, let me, uh, let me invite you all to join in a feast for the intellect this afternoon or evening, and join me in welcoming to the podium for a plenary address, What Happened, Augustine and the History of Late Antiquity, Professor Jillian Clark. Thank you so much, Kevin, and it is a great pleasure to come back to Villanova, especially for a working conference, <laughs> which allows me to learn from experts on such a wide range of periods and topics. And it's that range, Kevin told me, which prompted a focus on history and historiography. I've been writing that for days, so the maybe moments when I look hurriedly at the margin. <laughs> Many fields. Many methods, many disciplines, many perspectives. How do we tell the story of late antiquity, the ages, the Renaissance, if indeed there is one story to tell? So I offered a title with a double meaning. It's about Augustine's understanding of history as he saw it in his own time, which we now call late antiquity. And it's about Augustine's challenges to present-day historians and to their understanding of great antiquity. We'll be moving between Augustine's present and the historical past, as Augustine and his opponents understood it. And we shall, of course, be concerned with city of Magnum Opus et Ardu, <laughs> that great and exhausting work, <laughs> as the Bible of Opus was going to translate into that phrase. Now, I'm a classicist by training. I came to late antiquity relatively late by a very Augustinian series of happenings. So, actually, everyone here knows more than I do about 
patristics, medieval studies, and Renaissance studies, and you will all have much to contribute to the conversation after this talk. Let's begin with a medieval and Renaissance perspective on this major patristic work. If you're interested in the history of commentary, you will know that although Augustine was so often cited as an authority, only three of his works attracted commentary in the medieval Renaissance periods. Unsurprisingly, they are the big three Confessions, De Trinitate, De Cubitate Dei. And for our questions, it's important that medieval and Renaissance commentators wrote much more about the first 10 books of City of God than about the second group of 12, because it was the first 10 where help was needed. John Cavadini has just been busily subverting that distinction that they thought it was the <laughs> So in books 1 to 10, Augustine aims to refute those who prefer their own gods to the founder of the city of God. So he discusses claims that Many gods must be worshipped for blessings in this life or in the next. And that involves Roman history, Roman literature, Roman religion, Platonist philosophy, different aspects of the classical culture, which came to be known as humanity. In books 11 to 22, he sets out what is ours, that is, Christian. He discusses the origins, course, and due ends of the two cities, the city of God and the earthly city. And these books do indeed include, as John's been pointing out, some classical philosophy in contrast with Christian understanding of creation, of the relationship of body and soul, of the supreme good and the organization of society, of death and resurrection. Indeed, they include some ancient science when Augustine is demonstrating that yes, hell works it is quite possible for bodies to burn eternally. <laughs> <laughs> and in book 18, which we shall come, readers certainly needed her with Augustine's account of the history of the earthly city from the time of Abraham. But essentially, books 11 to 22 are concerned <coughs> with the exegesis of scripture and associated <coughs> And these were the familiar topics of divinity so students knew about them. So commentary grew in the margins of manuscripts. And the earliest printed texts of City of God, Antonin in Strasbourg, 1468, Amabach in Basel, 1489, offer Augustinus de Cibitate Dei cum commento. The commentary is still printed in the margins of the text. And these are the commentaries composed in the early 14th century by two English Dominicans, Nicholas Trevitt and his younger contemporary Thomas Wallace. They are the earliest commentaries we know. Trevitt came from my own home country, Somerset in the southwest of England, studied at Oxford and Paris, wrote commentaries not only on Boethius, as you might expect, but actually on Livy and Seneca and other classical texts. Always, he said, because colleagues or students had asked him for them. The old excuses. <laughs> <laughs> and in the preface to his commentary on City of God, he pointed out that his fellow Dominican, Robert Le Wardby, had assisted readers by providing content summaries instead of brief headings. But Augustine's references to little known events and to pagan literature were obstacles to reading. So, uh, especially in books 1 to 10 and book 18. So at the repeated request of his brothers, Trevitt would try to explain. Move on a few decades from those first printed editions, and as the Renaissance experts will know, Erasmus decided that the world required a new and improved edition of the complete works of Augustine with commentary. And in 1516, he met Louis de Bates, whom I shall now use resolutely English pronunciation, because in 1523, <coughs> Thomas More, no less, got him a fellowship at the new foundation of Corpus Christi College, Oxford. Mm -hmm. Vives rashly agreed to provide 
the new text and commentary. The City of God. It took him much longer than he expected. Which was very much longer than Erasmus expected. <laughs> and he did wish he'd allowed himself more time because he said the City of God is so long, so diverse, raises so many questions about history and mythology and natural and, myth and moral philosophy and, of course, theology. <coughs> but when he'd finished Book 7, which is about Barry's interpretation of Roman religion, Vites observed that except for Books 8 to 10, which are on Plato's law, and Book 18, the other books would need less work because much of the material is obvious. Everyone knows stories from scripture, and he can simply limit the discussion of theology because otherwise it would go on forever. <laughs> now, Trivet spoke of Augustine's references to little-known events. For Augustine, the point was that they were very well-known events. Educated people knew them from school. They were familiar examples in public speeches. I don't know if there's a US equivalent to the English classic 1066 and all of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it starts from the principle that history is what you remember, and it works through gloriously <coughs> misremembered historical events, <laughs> or, of course, events of English history. <laughs> it ends when America is clearly top nation, so history comes to a full stop. Roman <laughs> <laughs> history, in that sense, this is the history that Romans read and remembered and wanted their children to know. That's why he treats Virgil as history. He uses the word historia to mean written history as distinct from res gesta, things done. Yeah. And early in City, City of God, he makes it clear that this is not his job. <coughs> if he even listed the events of the Punic Wars, he too would be nothing other than a writer of history. He doesn't have time. It really doesn't matter for his argument whether King Numa ruled Rome in peace for 43 years or for 39 years. <laughs> the point of this, for our concern, is that the Punic Wars show what Augustine thought was the typical subject matter of history. Victory and defeat hang in the balance. Kingdoms and towns are destroyed. Territory is devastated. <coughs> Soldiers and civilians are killed. Fleets are lost at sea. Such subjects offered scope for rhetorical development, more charitably, for attempts to make language convey the scale and the intensity of events. It's actually very noticeable if you assess funding applications, as I do. Historians really mind about the quality of writing. It's still there. So Augustine uses this kind of written history for his own purposes to illustrate the dreadful events of Rome's past. It is a small range of written history. City of God came to be a treasury of classical learning, as Vives said in a letter of dedication to King Henry VIII of England. Not well known as a classical scholar, but actually, apparently, he was quite good at it. Vives argued for a special printing of City of God because, he said, it's the only work of Augustine that humanists would really want. They don't want the complete work. Well, it's, a, it's a treasury of classical learning, but in practice, Augustine exploited a very small selection of quotations from a very limited number of books. For example, in Book 6, he gives a complete contents list from Barrow's Antiquitates, the great work on <coughs> Roman tradition, which was praised by Cicero for making Romans at home in their own city where they can wander around like tourists saying, I wonder what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Augustine's opponents respected Varro, probably hadn't read him, but he was reverently cited by teachers taking their classes through Virgil, as Augustine had done in his own first career. There were 41 books of Varro's Antiquitates, 
It looks as if Augustine read two of them. <laughs> From the 16 on divine antiquities, the introduction and the final book on these select gods. We don't know whether he had the text of the whole thing. Classicists are duly grateful for his citations and summaries of texts that haven't otherwise survived. From Cicero de Republica, from Variety, from Seneca de Superstitione, from Porphyry in translation. But when we have the complete text, as we do for Aculeus, <coughs> we can see Augustine's technique. It was very familiar from schools of <coughs> You want to make your opponent's witnesses testify for you. So Augustine selects a very small number of killer quotes, taken out of context without regard to the overall arguments of the author. We can imagine listening as a notarius reads the text, and sometimes saying, ah, I don't know to that. <laughs> and he presents these quotations as damaging admissions, which he insistently repeats, usually with a tendentious interpretation of what the author must mean or clearly says. Every time Augustine tells you that beyond doubt, proco dubio, somebody needs this, you know they did. Augustine not yet well-known words from Roman history to make an argument which is central to the first five books of City of God, the ones in which he refutes claims that many gods must be worshipped for blessings in this life. At the start of book one, he assumes that his audience already knows what he means by the City of God and by its earth, the earthly city. And he had been working with those themes for a decade. Okay. So commentators, of course, import the famous definition, which he doesn't actually reach until the end of Book 14. Two loves made two cities. The city of God is the community of all who love God, even to disregard of self. The earthly city is the community of all who love self, even to disregard of God. But at the start of Book 1, we know only that the enemies of the city of God prefer their own gods to its founder. They think these gods gave them a great empire, and they blame Christians who refuse power to the gods of Rome for the recent disaster which has afflicted the city. That is, the sack of Rome by a war band of gods in August 410. Now, the sack of Rome is a striking example of Augustine's effect on recent writing of history. It is not so long since Jerome's rhetoric prevailed. <coughs> the brightest light of the whole world is heart. The empire lies a headless corpse. The whole world has perished in one city. The Gothic sack of Rome is right up there with Virgil on the fall of Troy and the prophet Jeremiah on the fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. And when the dreadful news reached Bethlehem, Jerome was so distraught he could barely remember his own name, let alone finish his overdue commentary on Ezekiel. <laughs> <laughs> but in 2010, there was, of course, much anniversary literature. And in 2015, Peter van Uffelen's review discussion appeared in the Journal of Roman Studies with the title, Not Much Happened, <laughs> 410 and all that. <laughs> <laughs> the archaeological record, such as it is, it's really very difficult to excavate in central Rome, confirms Augustine's response in the sermon which now has the title, De Excidio Orbis, it's not his title, he knew the city wasn't destroyed. Yes, says Augustine, in the really rather few sermons in which he addresses this subject, terrible things happened, but keep it in perspective. Rome was not wiped off the face of the earth like Sodom and Gomorrah, cities of the plain. The ravaging of lasted only for three dreadful days. <laughs> 
and Rome had known far worse. In City of God, Augustine points out that the bloodthirsty barbarian Goths spared those who took refuge in churches and martyr shrines. Where in Roman history will you find a foreign commander sparing people who take refuge in temples, <coughs> even if they worship the same gods? Now, Augustine, of course, was not the only factor in reassessing the sack of Rome. But the reassessment exemplifies a general argument which matters to him. Educated people know their history better, but they prefer not to correct the uneducated. In recent years in the UK, we've had our share of claims that the Roman Empire fell because of uncontrolled immigration. Uneducated people blamed any disaster on the Christians. So the obvious counter argument was worse things happened when the gods of Rome were still receiving help. Not just before the emperor Theodosius I formally banned public and private cult in 391, but BC, before Christianity. Not, of course, a category then in use. <coughs> Augustine wants to show from authority respected <coughs> by its means. It was far otherwise than they think. Dreadful things happened to Rome from the time of its foundation and even before when Aeneas brought his defeated arms from Troy. So Augustine exploits a Sallust and Livia, respected historians who lived in what we now call the 1st century BCE and the early 1st century CE. In Augustine's time, these were standard school texts for Latin-speaking schoolboys. They were important for history and also, of course, for style. They provide familiar stories of defeat and disaster, moral decline, atrocities in civil war, which afflicted <coughs> Rome in the centuries before Christianity. So almost all the history in City of God comes from what we call Republican Rome. There's very little on anything later than Augustus, the first emperor. And if Augustine uses any later historians, he doesn't acknowledge them. Medieval and Renaissance experts will know how this affects the transmission of Roman history to later periods. I imagine that Erosius was a whole lot more use if you were doing Roman history. But Augustine used Roman historians to show that the gods who allegedly made Rome a great empire failed to protect its people from disaster, whether moral or physical. And he challenged the assumption that empire is a good thing. That challenge confronts the traditions of written history as he knew it. He warns against being carried away by the big words, by talk of empires and kingdoms and provinces. We should think instead in terms of people. Imagine one who is modestly prosperous, dutiful, generally beloved. One who is super rich, aggressive, scared, suspicious. Empire is not in itself great. And glorious. But history writing, as Augustine knew it, did indeed talk of empires and kingdoms and provinces, of great men and great events which supplied good subjects for dramatic writing. <coughs> Augustine warns again, don't tell me that X or Y is a great man because he fought A or B and won. That's what gladiators do. The obvious reply is that the victory of a king has much more impact than the victory of a gladiator. But Augustine's focus is, as always, the moral behavior of a human being. And that's why he borrows from Cicero the very well-known story of Alexander the Great asking a captive pirate what he thought he was doing, infesting the sea. And the pirate replies, same as you do, infesting the world. But because I do it with a little boat, I'm called Latro. Because you do it with a big fleet, you're called Imperator. <laughs> now, the 
thought of an empire as a latrotinian, a gang of latrotes, is very familiar, probably one of the most quoted books of Augustine. <coughs> but think for a moment about this category, latro. Latrones take what they want by force. They're not formally enemies, according to Cicero, but they're everyone's enemy because you can't make a deal with them, you can't trust them. Latrones, in present-day terms, are pirates or brigands. <coughs> they have a cause. They're terrorists, if you do think that they have a cause, but you don't approve of it. And they're freedom fighters, if you do approve. Remember that Jesus was crucified between two latrones. It's always translated as the two thieves, but there's actually rather a lot more to it. So empires, says Augustine, are scaled up latrochemia. And borrowing again from Cicero, he knows <coughs> that latrochemia had an agreed command structure and structure rules for sharing out the loop. Empire began when Ninos, king of Assyria, invaded the territory of inoffensive Ninos. And even when empire begins in defensive or protective war, as Romans preferred to think, some Romans injustice prompted that war. Romans often deify abstracts, Augustine observes. If they want to ascribe their empire to a god, well, why not deify foreign injustice? what causes empires. But of course, empire is not owed to one specific god. Everything happens by the will or the permission of the true god, who chose that after many great kingdoms in the east, there should also be one in the west. And to overcome the evils which had afflicted other peoples, he gave it to people who subordinated all their other desires to their desire for glory. Augustine needed to counter the claim that the gods of Rome fostered the Roman mores, the moral qualities, which helped the empire to grow. And he concedes that some Romans offered impressive examples of <coughs> courage, self-sacrifice, personal austerity, but they were motivated by pride. They have their reward. <coughs> they had glory in their lifetimes. They're remembered after their deaths. And what was all that for? <coughs> in terms of individual human lives. For morality, for security, it doesn't matter who wins and who loses, who rules and who is ruled. Does it matter whether you're free from external domination? Is it a problem if peace is imposed on you? Did the Romans harm the people on whom they imposed the laws? by which they themselves lived. It's interesting, Augustine doesn't comment. This actually applies to the Roman province of Africa, his homeland, which was conquered in those Punic Wars six centuries earlier. Augustine did not advance the argument made by many other Christian authors, including his admirer Orosius, that the peace and unity of the Roman world made it possible for the Christian message to spread. That's why the birth of Christ came at the time when Augustus, the first Roman emperor, had achieved peace on land and sea. Augustine had very little to say about Augustus. Civil wars grow ever more atrocious. Liberty gives way to monarchy. Christ is born while Augustus rules. Wars continue. Augustine recognized that the Roman Empire brought firstly peace and better communication, a common language, well, two actually, but we're only thinking about that, <laughs> a common language with plenty of interpreters. <clears throat> but at what a cost in blood. How much better if it had been achieved by agreement? We know that empire is not a secure good because God gives it to good people and to bad people for reasons we do not understand. There's no need for imperial empire in the sense a great extent of territory. There is need for imperium in the traditional Roman sense, the acknowledged right to give orders. 
Because unless there's agreement on who gives the orders and who takes them, there will be permanent conflict at all levels of society, household, city, world, because all human beings inherit the desire to have their own way. It doesn't matter who gives the orders and who takes them, what form of government there is. Augustine exploited Sallust and Cicero and Livy on Roman civil conflicts, on the view of public leadership, on the displacing outworn liberty. But from that, Augustine was interested only in the evidence for conflict. For Sallust and Cicero, the differences between populus and plebs, rex and princeps, imperium and regno were critical for the politics of the late Roman Republic. Augustine uses the words interchangeably, which makes them very difficult to translate. He read Cicero de Republica while he was writing City of God, but he simply skipped Cicero's discussion of the best form of government. This actually makes sense, both in terms of Augustine's priorities and in terms of late Roman society. Late ancient philosophers really do not do political philosophy. There's no point in debating the mixed constitution when appointments and policy making had long since disappeared from the public sphere into plots in the palace. There was no prospect of an end to monarchy. Regime change meant only a different ruler, strategic executions, then cautious requests for confirmation, but the laws continued unchanged. One of Augustine's letters is like that, and Augustine's letters in general <coughs> show present-day historians how much depended on who was in charge at the local level. He didn't write quote, theory. His reflections on the use of force and the purpose of punishment come from interaction with the local officials who were responsible for maintaining the law and order and, of course, for extracting the taxes to fund it. Uh, medievalists will know more than I do about later attempts to co-opt Augustine for a city of God on earth, a race publica Christi, in the sense that justice prevails and God receives the worship which is his due because secular readers are guided by the church. In relation to the city of God, I find this very puzzling because right at the end of book one, <coughs> Augustine reaffirmed that in the earthly city, there may be future citizens, the city of God, and adds that some who share the sacraments of the church may be citizens of the earthly city. The two cities are mixed until they are pulled apart in the final judgment, and until then, we do not know who belongs to which. So in this supposed Res Publica Christi, we wouldn't know the citizenship of the rulers and subjects for the church authority. Augustine knew what historians as good topics. And in City of God, he subverted a lot. Great men, great events, victory, defeat, huge losses in war, empires and kingdoms and provinces. What matters always is how individuals behave. We shouldn't blame the times in which we live. We are the times. Rome is the Romans. It's not timber and stone. Rome is a collection of people. Some Romans are Christian, some are not. Some barbarians are savage and merciless. Some respect <coughs> Christianity. We do not know God's will for Rome and its empire. Rome has recovered from past disasters and may do so again. We do not know that there will be 10 persecutions which are now over, even if we knew how to come, which we don't. The Lord said that it is not for us to know times and seasons. So no predictions of the apocalypse. As one of my favorite clergy used to say, for all we know, we are the early church. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> is there to make this point that we don't know times and seasons. Pagans claimed that an oracle said Christianity would last 365 years and then come to an end. But, says Augustine triumphantly, not only has the deadline passed, the year after it passed, on March the 18th, 399, two companions of the emperor came to Carthage and overthrew the <coughs> temples of the false gods into Greek images. Well, Augustine got his dates a little wrong, but still, you see, he scarcely mentions recent history. When he does, it's to show that we should not think the true God is to be worshipped for rewards in this life, such as victory and prosperity, and a long and peaceful reign followed by a smooth transition. Christian emperors may suffer defeat, pagan emperors may achieve victories. The real blessings in the life of the most Christian emperor, Theodosius I, are his virtuous actions. Wars end sooner or later as God wills. Everything happens by the will or permission of God for his own inscrutable but always just purpose. So how can anyone write history? What happened? What comes as an event? How do we select the events which are important for history? We know what Augustine thinks is important, but we don't know how things happen. Not by fate or by chance, he says. <coughs> All efficient causes are voluntaries, choices, which come from God or are permitted by God. What looks like chance is in fact a hidden cause. Natural causes can't be separated from the will of God who created nature. We don't know how anyone responds to God. We don't know what anyone truly loves. We can't even write our own histories, as Augustine so vividly showed in Confessions. We make sense of things by marriage, but how can he shape and select? What has he forgotten? What does he not know? What looks different now? Has he even reinvented some things? This actually came home to me very sharply a few years ago. On election to the British Academy, one receives a charming letter which says that in the fullness of time, though of course we have not for many years, there will be an obituary. It would then be very helpful to have some information, especially on the early years, which were otherwise remembered. That was a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Is all history invented? Is it fiction in the sense that it's a story selected and edited by the historian? Well, actually, there is a difference, isn't there? You can't say that the author of fiction has got it wrong. <laughs> but another historian can offer evidence that the story is inadequate or misleading or even falsified. So that's the distinction between deliberate lies and saying what is not in fact the case. So what happened? when Augustine himself has to write history. He said he wasn't a historian, but the task does confront him in book City of God 18, which at first sight has an impossible remit. 18 is the last of the four books on the course of the two cities. And as it begins, Augustine acknowledges that for the last book and a half, that is, from the time of Abraham to the coming of Christ, he has, in fact, written only about <coughs> that is, about God's dealings with his people as recorded in the Bible. <coughs> it's very tempting for academics, isn't it, to identify with Augustine. At this point, he does sound so like a professor who has two classes to go before the end of the semester and is way behind schedule. <laughs> uh, especially claim, when he claims that his focus on the city of God was really quite deliberate. It was to make contrast stand out more clearly. Uh, but he does now need to discuss the other city as much as seems sufficient for comparison. <coughs> He's got to catch up with world history from the time of Abraham. Bear in mind that according to Eusebius, 
Abraham lived 2,242 years before any Greek or non-Greek history was ever heard of. So it's really not surprising that in the second part of City of God, Augustine has so far scarcely mentioned non-biblical history. Well, what could possibly seem sufficient for comparison of the history of the earthly city with the history of the city of God as told in scripture? Augustine's answer makes sense in relation to his worldview. What actually matters in human history? Not empires, not great men and great events, but how people behave in relation to God and to each other. The earthly city has two leading characteristics. It is dominated by the lust to dominate, and it makes and worships false gods. The lust to dominate is the basic problem with fallen human nature. I want my way, I want way, so you have to do it my way too. The false gods result from deception by demons, who also exemplify the basic problem with fallen human nature at the angelic level. They are the bad angels who turned away from God, wanting their way, not God's way, so they want people to turn away from God and worship them. Augustine swiftly establishes his themes. First, domination. People very rarely choose death over slavery, so they accept domination, and there are kingdoms. Simplification one. Two of these kingdoms stand out in extent and duration. Assyria earlier in the east, Rome later in the west, and all the others are appendages of these, and we didn't really them. <coughs> then to Abraham born among the Chaldeans in the reign of Nebus, the second king of Assyria, and you may remember the world's first imperialist. Simplification two. Varro, the authority, starts his De Gente Populi Romani, who are the Romans, at this time, with the very small kingdom of Sicilia, continuing to Athens, then to Latium, which precedes Rome. Now, none of Varro's pre-Roman kingdoms had imperial power remotely comparable to Assyria. But Greek history is much better known than Assyrian, which Augustine will use only for comparative data. So in practice, he can keep to Greek and Latin material. Right. He doesn't acknowledge until later and in passing <coughs> his use of the chronological tables of Eusebius, translated into Latin by Jerome with some additional notes on Roman history and updated to 378. But this remarkable piece of book production is actually essential to City of God, Book 18. It showed Augustine regna, kingdoms, set out in parallel columns, synchronized where possible with biblical history with occasional um, annotations. He could see how many kingdoms were important enough to need a column in a single page or a double page spread. The most you could have was nine at any one time. He could see how Babylon dominates the record of early history and how all the other columns disappear when Augustus defeats the Ptolemies and only the Roman Empire is left, which was actually rather disingenuous <coughs> who knew perfectly well, as Augustine did, that the Persians were still going strong. <laughs> so that's domination. Now, demonic deception and false gods. Until he reaches the foundation of Rome, Augustine's tactic is to alternate a brief, straightforward narrative from scripture with increasingly fantastic examples of gods from Greek and Latin tradition, deity humans, worship of animals, prompted, of course, by deceptive demons, Winged horses, human-animal compounds, metamorphosed humans, where again the demons are at work. They can't create, but they can transform appearance and delude people with phantasms. Augustine develops this example, these examples of men, and as Trevet and Fides found, readers did need help. Even so, it takes Augustine only half of this unusually long book to 
get to the point where Babylon ends, Rome begins, and he can thankfully get back to exegesis of the Hebrew prophets on the grounds that from now on they spoke to all nations, not just to Israel, but to Christ and <coughs> That's why the Roman Empire matters. There's a very rapid narrative sketch of how the Jews, in accordance with prophecy, lost their kings, came under foreign rule, were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire with their books to bear witness that Christians did not invent prophetic scriptures. And there's a powerful contrast of ancient, consistent, reliable Hebrew scripture in the utterly reliable Septuagint translation mm -hmm. with the later inconsistent, unreliable wisdom of the earthly city. Mm -hmm. When the authoritative scripture <coughs> ends with the book of Acts, Augustine does not turn to non-scriptural sources for a church history of mission, martyrs, bishops, councils, even though he had the church history of Eusebius in the Latin translation by Rufinus. Book 18 was already well over length. And really, all we need to know is that in accordance with prophecy, the church contains both good and bad. There are always persecutions from enemies outside or heretics within. We do not know times and seasons. We cannot predict the end. There's no suggestion, for instance, that the Roman Empire is in decline or that the church is in decline from the heroic days of martyrdom. Instead, there's the contrast between the two cities. The earthly city symbolized by Babylon is the city of confusion. Its historians can't agree about what happened when. Its philosophers can't agree on how to live. The city of God worships one true God, and its teachings are ancient, consistent, and accessible to all, regardless of education. Scripture provides a reliable narrative of its history, and that is the history that matters, not the familiar stories of Rome. So that's how Augustine writes history, when he has to do so in accordance with his commitment. Scripture can reliably tell him who belongs to the city of God? What happened by God's will? Why it happened? Until he can do it can do this until the coming of Christ. Scripture is prophetic, but it's prophetic of Christ and the Church, not of specific events in post-scriptural history. Stories told by historians who belong to the earthly city are not reliable though they may be useful in showing what its citizens mistakenly believed. So an Augustinian approach to writing history would seem to be, don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't. Even if you're writing about the spread of Christianity by mission and evangelism and the conversion of rulers, you can't because you haven't got an authority to help, and you don't know who belongs where. The two cities intermixed in this world experience the same events, but with different hope and different love. Of course, people did and do write history. And there are at least Augustinian themes in some of the reasons for continuing. Scholars who work on late antiquity or medieval studies or Renaissance studies or any other period are likely these days to agree with Augustine. But it's a mistake to be carried away by the big words, empires, kingdoms, provinces, great men, great events, as seen by people in one particular tradition. We still want to know what happened, whether the grand narratives are right, who has been overlooked or misrepresented, what we have not seen. Sometimes there's an immediate need to correct a cipher word. 410 was not a decisive moment. The Roman Empire did not fall because of uncontrolled immigration. And anyway, what do we mean by fall? What changed? When? For who? Did women have a fall of the Roman Empire too? Augustine does help 
to undermine some large-scale assumptions <laughs> about the workings of the Roman Empire, about law, about paganism. Um, for instance, if it's assumed that once Theodosius I banned pagan cult, well, then it's illegal, isn't it? It gradually ceases to exist. Uh, Augustine can, in some contexts, assert that there are hardly any pagans left. But his letters and sermons provide evidence that the world continued in the form of traditional ceremonies and cultural heritage, which were protected by the sons of Theodosius. That even Roman officials didn't always know what the law was. And if they did, they might be reluctant to act. It depends, of course, on the individual. And focus on individuals helps to challenge stereotypes and hard boundaries between Roman and barbarian, pagan and Christian, orthodox and heretic. Augustine points out that it really isn't easy to define heresy. And it is, of course, a misinterpretation to say that he argued for burning heretics. History is told by the victors because their writings survive and were copied. One of the most useful things historians can do is to try and hear the voices which were lost in wars and civil conflicts and disputes about doctrine. The voices of people who were labelled as pagans or heretics and whose books did not survive. The voices of people who didn't write the books, notably of women and working people. The voices of people in regions or in ethnic groups from which very little survives in writing or in material culture. We don't tell the story of late antiquity or of any other period of history because there isn't one story to tell. <clears throat> some stories, some narratives, some concerns predominate for a while. Then social and intellectual changes in our own societies bring shifts in interpretation, interest, questions to be asked, even without a formal diversity agenda, universities start to offer different courses, to appoint different kinds of people who see things differently because of their own experience. I remember being told way back in the 1980s that, oh yes, it would be nice to have a course on women in the ancient world, but there isn't any evidence. <laughs> <laughs> comes into focus if you have different people looking for it. If historians trained on Greek or Latin texts can also have access to Middle Persian or early Islamic texts, they will see things differently. One of the series I've read it, translated texts for historians, always offers complete texts, not extracts, because we cannot predict what will be of interest to another generation of historians. And if you think of chronicles, not so long ago, they weren't interesting until the author stopped excerpting earlier authors and got to his own times. These days, there's a lot of interest in what does he select? How does he put it together? In patristics, there are now graduate students who learn Coptic or Syriac as a first classical language rather than Greek or Latin. And anyone who was at Oxford this August would have seen the range of concerns and interpretations from orthodox respect for the fathers to historians who see religion as one more aspect of politics. The other modern languages raise questions too. You just try translating Kiwitas De or Res Publica into other modern languages. I was told by a Finnish colleague, for instance, that in his language, you can't get a contrast between church and state, because the state is us. Very Augustinian thought. Other disciplines suggest to us new models and questions. Can we use network theory, for instance, which was designed for big data, to trace communications networks, for which there's at best very little data, and every item of that is contested? There may even be some actual new evidence. Occasionally, some new texts emerge, or pollen analysis, and glaciation, and rainfall analysis suggest that the fifth to the seventh centuries were indeed an exceptionally cold, wet period. And I 
floods and transport problems and crop failures and epidemics, which are all there in the literary resources and the awful. <coughs> Where are the boundaries in time and space when we think in terms of the long late antiquity or of Eurasia, when we remember that Persia had an eastern as well as a western frontier? Does the PMR sequence work only for Western Europe? How does it fit with Byzantium? Patristics is a contested category. But what else would we call it when late ancient Christianities doesn't actually cover all that was done in late antiquity? And this must apply also to medieval and renaissance. Whose categories are these? What are their boundaries in time and space? Well, this is history in the earthly city, whose historians don't agree. And it's all very far from Augustine's canon and consensus and authoritative account. But even in the fifth century, that claim required some very ingenious and flexible exegesis. <coughs> and Augustine is right that while we have imperfect earthlings, <coughs> shared languages, interpreters, we can translate and converse and acknowledge complexity and hybridity and contextual identities and diversity of language and voices. The city of God collects its citizens from all cultures. It doesn't mind about languages, laws, traditions of disciplines. We too can be tried to citizens of the community of those throughout all ages who try to live in unity within the changing structures required by our imperfect world. Thank you for being here to help me. <laughs>
Could you ask that uh, one more time? Could you just repeat yourself? That last, no. um, if you work on medieval history or on Renaissance history, <coughs> are there any obvious characteristics for how your authors, your sources, write their histories? What do they select as important? And are they at all influenced by the Augustinian challenges? No. Or you know, to pick up on Kevin's question, are they actually trying to provide a history which might be a history of the city of God? Yeah, I was just thinking that most of the people I read in the Middle Ages, they're more like 12th and 13th century people. They don't really reference the city of God that much. You know, I mean, there may be some, but like Joachim of Fiore, he doesn't, I don't see that as really being in the background for him. And, uh, Rupert of Deutz, I don't recall like a strong influence there. So I don't know. I mean, maybe other people have seen it, but I haven't seen a lot of medieval appropriations of the city of God. They seem to be going in a different direction. That's very interesting. Uh, is there somebody they are appropriating particularly? <clears throat> It's mm -hmm. news track. Uh, Phil, and then in the 14th uh, century, uh, Nicholas of Lyra critiques all those who have a triumphalist uh, oh. sense of the, uh, of the history of the church. It's the church that will endure forever. Uh, so he has an Augustinian. He actually cites the city of God mm -hmm. regularly uh, to deconstruct uh, all of those who, who use history you know, to predict the, the, the future triumphs of the church. So, so he, he, in the 14th century, there's an Augustinian revi revival, uh, and he knows the city of God very well. Uh, he understands it. I mean, to, uh, you know, to talk about the ambivalence of history and that you can't use scripture to predict. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say I guess just by way of citing sources, the literature people do. Chaucer cites Geoffrey of Vansoff, and uh, some of the others. Well, uh, Robert Manning in his Chronicle of England goes back to day one and lists all the people. Mm -hmm. So, and they, day, is day one Adam? Or is it? Yeah. Yes, indeed. And, and, yes. Um, so, you know, it might be that it's the literature folk who are carrying the story forward. And that would apply very well to the salvation history plays of the 13th century. That's when you start with creation, sort of whiz through the ages, and then you sort of you get to the Franks or the Goths, or the people you really do want to work about. Yeah. Cruises Mundi as well. Right? So the, the Middle yeah. English Cruises Mundi. So. Yeah. Oh. I mean, the go-to in the 12th century and then in the 13th century in terms of history is uh, Peter Comester's sure. Historia right. Scholastica. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, maybe the CUA people or maybe Boyd, you, you might be able to speak to it more than I could, but, uh, you know, I know Mark Clark and, and people like that at CUA are doing, you know, trying to kind of recover what really is animating the Historia Scholastica and how this whole comment, I mean, there's... There appears in the manuscript traditions to be almost as much sort of gloss on the Historia Scholastica as on scripture and on Peter Lombard and the whole thing, but we haven't really told that narrative. We told the narrative about the Gospels, I mean, about biblical commentary, and we told the narrative about Lombard commentary because it dominates theological discourse for four or five hundred years. Um, but we're just now sort of digging out of the manuscripts this tremendous wealth of commentary on the Historia Scholastica. So, and again, someone knows it better say so, but in the 12th and 13th century, you know, the historical go-to for the, the magistry is the Historia Scholastica. And it is, in a, so to speak, as far as I understand it, trying to fill in the gaps in the biblical record. So they have this commitment that history has a telos, and I... And it seems to me it was, 
is the one thing that I find I found very provocative in what you said is that you know you don't know from what perspective to read history, but it seems to me that the thrust of all ecclesiastical histories, whether you treat De Civitate Dei that way, or you treat Bede's ecclesiastical history, or Eusebius' ecclesiastical history, or you get into the English history, like Malmesbury or, or, or whatever, that, I, I mean, for, for them, they read it in terms of the cross. Like, I mean, that is history. Christ is, is history, and, uh, and, and Christ is why history has meaning and why it's going towards something. And so I think about John's talk, you know, where the, the pivot between... You know, nine, ten, and eleven is is the incarnation, and that, and then, and I, and even liturgically we celebrate that. You know, we used to say in the Christmas vigils mass, we go through all the different chronologies. You do a Roman chronology, you do that chronology, you do that chronology, that chronology, and then finally, after the blank hundred centuries since the founding of Rome, then you talk about the incarnation. So I don't know. There's something. There's something both Christmas and Paschal about. You know, I, I think about the way Easter controversies figures into certain ecclesiastical histories. Yes, right, We've got to date Easter. We've got to get it right. Yeah. So, I don't know. Those are the kind of things that stand out to me in terms of medieval historiography. That's so. It links with what Augusta Reisenauer mm-hmm. was saying. Mm-hmm. Even if you've got the Six Ages right. as a structure, the Six Ages end with the first coming of Christ. And after that, there doesn't seem to be any well, and this is my gloss. Mm-hmm. There doesn't seem to be any history. But. Steve and then John. Um, you mentioned Nicholas Trivet, uh, yes. the early the early commentator. He was a, a historian in his own right and wrote a compendious history that uh, Chaucer readers may be familiar with uh, as the Man of Lost Tale, which comes from Trivet's uh, Anglo-Norman history. And one of the things that marks that story, uh, the story of Constance, is that the world seems to be divided into the Roman Christian world where everyone speaks Latin, has perfect grammar and perfect hygiene and always tells the truth. And the rest of the world where they speak other languages badly, have terrible personal habits and lie all the time. Uh, so uh, in a lot of ways, that's the, that's a sort of cartoon version of the the Imperia that you've been, you, you were talking about today. I don't ask which one is which. <laughs> That's not. <laughs> in uh, Origen's commentary on Matthew, there is a lot of really interesting details about his concern for historicity, which I think a lot of people would be surprised to hear that. But um, he uses Josephus on a couple of occasions to put what he thinks is the historical context of this passage. Uh, he's trying to set it with a reference to Josephus. On another instance, he's talking about, um, I forget the parable account, but then he he writes in there, uh, this would not have occurred to us had one of the Hebrews not told us about the story of, um, in Judaism, converting somebody's debt that they couldn't pay off into a gift for the community. And so Orson says, well, that's really good. And then he recognizes, okay, maybe that's what's happening in our churches when bishops and deacons misappropriate these funds, because that's what Jesus accuses oh. these people of doing. So, I mean, he goes, uh, uh, he has a variety of methods, a variety of sources for going around and trying to find out at least, you know, something of the historical context <clears throat> of, of that, whether he's right or wrong. But he makes a, a use of quite a few different sources. Well, I was just going to uh, make two, I guess, pretty disparate comments. One was picking up on Eric's observation. Um, I don't I don't know as much as I wish I did about this either, but um, one thing that Mark Clark has recently argued, I think actually it's not come out yet, but the, the guy who's working on the historic this class um, has made a suggestion, and I just wonder what you think of this, that, um, that in lots of ways Peter Comester is self-consciously imitating Josephus uh, as, a, as a sort of model of what it means to write history. Um, I don't know enough about Josephus as a history writer to, to you know, draw on that very much, but I just wondered if that you know, was uh, helpful in clarifying. Um, uh, <laughs> the other comment, I, uh, just by, by chance, because it relates to the paper I'm going to present tomorrow, I happen to have 
uh, R. W. Southern's uh, address to the Royal Historical Society, where he talks about Hugh of St. Victor as kind of the hero of medieval history writing. Um, I, I wonder if I could just read you a little excerpt of this and get you to yeah. comment and react. I, I was struck by this claim. That Southern is not shy of making claims. <laughs> <laughs> Suffice to say. Yes. Yeah. But, so here's a, uh, kind of narrating the difference between uh, ancient, uh, largely pre-Christian history writing versus Christian history writing, especially as it comes into the Middle Ages. He says this, the intellectual background of universal history is not provided by the rhetoric of the ancient schools, but by the framework of creation, fall, and redemption, which Christianity gave to the Western world. This cosmic plan gave birth to a new view of history, which was the most important intellectual contribution that Christianity made to the stock of ancient learning. Wow. So I, I think so. This point is that what Christian what Christianity gives to history writing is a sense of sort of a of a, of a universal scope of history, mm -hmm. one that's that's universal, not made, not, not only for perhaps in a kind of uh, synchronic way, but also in a dichronic way. That there's a kind of a beginning and a clear a sense of an end, and the whole thing is 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 contained. Mm -hmm. I don't so know, it's that... not just the succession of empires which gave an earlier framework, but right. yeah. So, yeah, you, yeah. Me? Yes, you. No. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, you're next. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I was wondering if I could ask you a question about Augustine's retrieval of Libby um, and his, his God. Um, in, the, in, the, in the prefix um, to um, the walk, Libby explicitly says that one of the reasons he's writing this history of Rome is to provide positive and negative examples to events and exemplum. Um, so that people who find themselves in leadership can figure out like, what, what behaviors to mimic. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, when you're talking about the importance of ethical <coughs> behavior for Augustine in the City of God, um, what Augustine's relationship is, if any, or in opposition to Livy's under, like, ethical, like, Livy's use of history to provide moral paradigms mm -hmm. for behavior, mm -hmm. um, especially insofar as the Roman Empire is plagued with um, demons and pride, whereas um, the city of God is not. Yeah. yeah, it's the pride that matters. Um, and Augustine is actually quite prepared to acknowledge that some of the exempla cited by Livy and by many other authors really <coughs> are extraordinarily impressive. Right? Regulus, for instance, um, people who engage in great self-restraint. That's fine. Why are they doing it? What do they love? Mm -hmm. And he concludes that they love themselves. And they get the reward for that. You know, it's like the argument that why did Lucretia commit suicide? Well, either because she knew very well it was not rape, she'd gone along with it and couldn't stand it, or because what mattered to her was her reputation. So it was the wrong kind of love. It was love for themselves. He does indeed use the example. Again, it's a small selection, not nearly as much <coughs> as we've got. There's a very good paper that Catherine Conner wrote ages ago in a collection edited by Mark. History, Apocalypse, mm -hmm. and you know that one? Yeah. Catherine has a paper on particularly the figure of Camillus. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that would be very interesting for you. If, uh, yeah. 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 On, on the Historia Scholastica, mm -hmm. um, learning off of Eric on that, it strikes me that in many ways it's quite Augustinian because it's really a biblical history. Uh -huh. That what it's trying to do is, in some ways, it reminds me of what. Um, the late antique authors are doing with the harmony of the Gospels, mm -hmm. when they try to do, you know, like, let's get these four Gospels harmonized, mm -hmm. is uh, Commester sets out to get the biblical story down in one understandable narrative. Uh -huh. Like, you know, it's almost presented as like a people's Bible. So if you have this, and you have this, and you have the sentences, you have everything you need to preach. Like, you have your doctrine and your Bible, this whole story. But it strikingly ends with like the biblical narrative, like uh -huh. it's the biblical narrative, and it strikes me as like, it's very Augustinian, right? It's yeah. Augustine gets, and then what do I do when I get to the incarnation, right? Mm. Uh, he, he really struggles to go anywhere past Peter, right? Like uh -huh. Peter's the culmination of 
is history. So it seems it strikes me as very similar in that way. At least Mester's history is is an Augustinian history where it's culminating with the biblical narrative. And so in that way, it's, it's a very similar history. After well, just haven't got an authoritative to keep to keep going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Sorry. I keep thinking just along those lines of medieval scrolls. Mm-hmm. So like Harvard's Houghton Library did a, an exhibit on medieval scrolls is mm-hmm. representative of history. And, and, um, and I, I'm no expert on this, but they start with Adam mm-hmm. sort of in that same sense and then trace all the kings, you know, mm-hmm. through Christ. And it's, it's directly relating a, a, the history of England or whatever mm-hmm. period to biblical history. It's, it's mm-hmm. fascinating, and it does it visually as well, but just it's, as a source. It's managing to get past the biblical narrative. Yeah, yeah, and it's start, but they, they tend to start, if I recall, and it's been a long time, mm-hmm. in creation, uh-huh. and then they'll go through creation and trace all of the kings, you know, through uh, Abraham and Christ, and it's... Uh, Picking up on that as Very well. Effective. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, that's a you know, <coughs> point, sort of well taken, but think about Otto Freising or folks like this, right? Now, the, I think the mark of, of medieval history seems to be to say, okay, we need to talk about creation, and then we'll talk about everything else we want to talk about, and then, we, then we'll talk about the eschatological end. I mean, it's always sort of framed in this, precisely within that frame, which, you know, is. It's an interesting way. It's sort of learning Augustine's lesson, but doing it differently than Augustine does, uh-huh. right? You know, <laughs> so which is interesting to think. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I'm not a historian, and I don't know much about historiography. So forgive if this is a too crude a question. But I was thinking of is it Stendhal in the Red and Black says truth can only be found in novels. Yeah, in the kind of critique of uh, fictionality of the historian, I think. Um, so the way I understood it, the Augustinian historian, you said, is either silent or subverts by tending to lost voices or things that percolate beneath the surface of convention, but has no providentialist or uh, philosophy of history after the close of prophecy, which is to say the Augustinian historian is a methodological naturalist who's no different than any old secular historian. Um, and if you write like Augustine or Jonathan Edwards, you probably wouldn't get tenure. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a kind of old question, like why history matters. Is, does that mean the sort of lesson of history for the Augustinian is you can't learn anything really important from it? And so, so you're not, uh, it's not a kind of philosophy by, by example in the way maybe Thucydides thought of it. Um, and I don't know, I guess I'm just wondering, does that mean that the, the narratives are all morally and theologically neutral after the close of prophecy? I am not sure that the neutral your point. His existentialists declare that they are in complete despair yet go on writing. That's a response to some of that. Um, they wouldn't. I think be morally or, philosoph- or philosophically neutral. I have never actually understood what a philosophy of history might be. Mm. But I don't know if anyone here does. <laughs> but what do you Unless you've got a sort of affirmation, well, I think this is how things happen. And I think this is what is interesting which doesn't seem more of a philosophy than the sort of thing you find in coffee shops saying our philosophy is. <laughs> but perhaps somebody else does know what a philosophy of history might be. So could everybody hear back I'm halfway down the road? <laughs> um, um, do, do volunteer philosophies of history. Hang on, sir. In return. <laughs> <laughs> the variety of histories. Yes, I think you're right. There will be some that claim to be authoritative in terms of what is actually happening and what is important. How they would support those claims without pointing to we have the authoritative text. I don't know. Matt and then Terence. You mentioned um, the distinction between historia on the one hand and res gesta on the other. Um, when it comes to the term historia, 
Do you think that Augustine had a conceptual distinction between something like narrative, story, fiction, mythos on the one hand, versus something like history on the other? Because that distinction exists in Greek at the lexical level. You've got mythos, story, and then historia in Greek that means something else. Inquiry. Yeah, yeah whatever Herodotus does. This is Aristotle. Mm-hmm. So there's a concept, there's a there's a distinction there at the lexical level. Yeah, that is interesting. Isn't it? Um, <clears throat> what kind of distinction between well, there's historia, which is what people write, but somewhere there are res gesta, things that were done, things that happened. But my question is specifically yeah. about myth, mythos, mm-hmm. narrative. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For which I suppose, well, Augustine thinks the Latin for mythos is father. Okay, it? yes, good, which good. Has, and good. This comes up when he's talking about Varro on religion and the failure of Varro's distinction between fabula. Yeah, I'm sure there's more about this than I can. Yes. So, um, yes, Augustine does have a distinction between stories that people make up and Mm -hmm. things that are actually true. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the writing of history, Mm -hmm. then I think we probably come back to, unless it says in the Bible, we're stuck. (laughs) We don't know what the difference is between the Grace Gesta and the account that people write about. Terence. Uh, thank you. Uh, I was just going to ask uh, about a kind of other history that uh, Augustine writes, which is uh, the Confessions, and how, how or if uh, this story of his life, uh, the story of uh, uh, these aspects of Monica's life, uh, would affect how we might think about an Augustinian account of history. Because it is a story of past, of things that were done, uh, um, and that he thinks is important, that he would be in later life who would look back and say, I really enjoy this book, kind of fine. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever say that, but uh, that, if we should bring the confessions to this question of what are we doing when we write history uh, in an Augustinian sense? One question comes is at what point, as I read them and see that things I haven't noticed, actually were, at what point in that process stopped? It is actually very interesting how things shift in remembrance and perception. It's one of the things that interests me about the figure of Monica, which we've all been talking about. The took to her heart, remembered always, and has been used by anxious mothers throughout the centuries. <laughs> the son of those tears cannot be lost. And no one ever quotes the bit that comes before it, which is, please go away. <laughs> <laughs> it was a harassed bishop thinking of it. <laughs> um, and that's actually a very nice example of, it's something that Augustine really likes, something that gets said and you had no notion that it was going to have the impact but it did and we must all experience this as teachers the student (laughs) reappears years later and my husband was once stopped in the street by one of his philosophy students who said you won't remember me i was the one who thought it was all right to kill someone as long as they were asleep (laughs) (laughs) which is why you never invited him over to spend (laughs) 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 say something (coughs) that caused him to decide that this position really worked quite (laughs) do he had no wish that this effect was going to happen but that would to revert to your question sorry that's where I think confessions might present a problem as a model for the writing of personal history. I do find now that I can look back and see a trajectory in things which at the time felt very much like 
okay, there's a bit of teaching going here, I'd better do that. This must be very familiar to many people in the room. Oh, okay, there's a job for Stephen, we have to move halfway down the country. And but looking back, you can actually see some kind of trajectory. Depend and you can probably see if something had happened a little bit differently, the overall effect would have been different. But that doesn't give one terribly much encouragement for the writing of history beyond the personal level. Uh, Andrew and then Martha. Andrew, yeah. I wonder whether oh, we the, contact. That's a, Andrew first, then Martha. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Our, a question, kind of a question. Maybe I'm looking for a reaction. Um, but I'm curious about, like, non-Augustinian, Augustinian historiography, or history, right? So, like, what happens when people very formed in the Augustinian tradition start doing history the way that Augustine never would? Yeah. Um, so, and I think you said that in the 12th century, so with, um, so if we say, like, one of the things about Augustinian history is that, you know, kind of, like, after, after Christ comes, well, you know, his, you know, it's kind of over. Well, you know, <laughs> Ansel of Havelberg, like, has this, like, talks about historical development that happens after that. Or if you think about um, Aylred, uh, Aylred of Revue, you know, he's doing, it almost, at times, like, with the, the kind of typical, it's very Augustinian, because you've got memory and intellect and will, and he's using that to, to execute scripture with the literal and the, uh, you know, kind of the um, allegorical and the tropological sense, but then he kind of shifts a little from just exegeting scriptural history to exegeting English history. <laughs> um, it's of course very important. <laughs> <laughs> In a lot of the ways, you know, that, that we were just being mentioned, uh, kind of going back to be the venerable and then his own kind of history of England from, you know, Adam until now. So I, what, what do you do about the Augustinian-ness of like very Augustinian methods that have turned their back on a pivotal part of Augustine's mm. theory of how to do history? Mm. That is very interesting. I mean, this is where lots of people know a lot more about these historians than I do. Do they, do they offer the typical historian thing of starting off with, I'm going to write about this because it's a really good topic. And nobody else has done a book on it yet, and which you do find in the ancient world. <laughs> well, they have, but it's all wrong. So, um, do, do all his medieval historians offer, this is why I am writing this book? Mm. Yeah? And quite apart from, well, my colleagues insist. Because <laughs> they, they have to. The brethren need it, right? Well, exactly. Yes. Uh, they needed to know. How did we get here? Yeah. Um. I'm, I'm struck in, in, a, in a contemporary sense between the parallels that you drew between Eusebius and Augustine in, in their treatment, specifically of how they approach other historical sources, in that Eusebius says other histories were concerned with things of empire and things of blood, and I am concerned with the things of the church and the things of the martyrs and that sort of thing. Uh, and the way that Eusebius uses... Philo and Josephus to sort of prove his point. But Eusebius differs dramatically in that he applies biblical prophecy to events after uh, Christ's death. Thanks. And so there's this sort of exegetical move that Eusebius is willing to make that Augustine is, is very uneasy mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of medieval history in a certain sense, follows Eusebius in that example more than Augustine. Uh -huh. Interesting. No, it does with the guilty conscience, I think. I, you know, <laughs> I, I think that, that you see medieval story, I'd be sort of tussling with this. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how much can we know? Mm -hmm. and how much can we not know? You know, in the sort of Joe Comis tradition is, that's too much. You, can, you think you know too much. Uh, you know, uh, the critique of Joe Comis tradition is that, among the other things. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's really, I think it's really divided. Mm -hmm. Martha? I wonder if the medieval lit people look at history a little bit differently from anything that you have been mentioning, simply because the history is 
everywhere in medieval lit. The Nine Worthies, The Legend of Good Women, The Exemplar, uh, Manning, The Polychronicon. It's everywhere. It's part of your life. And those references are supposed to be something that you know and you understand what the reference is. If Woodridge's edition of Pierce Plowman has uh, cited, uh, as has set out what the references are, and there are hundreds of references to Augustine in Langwood, A, B, and C. And, you know, it's carrying it forward to something that you would read, use, the uh, Ars Predicandi as well would carry those things forward. And so, um, yes, there is, and oh, they all, all, all will take you to bliss. It's the standard, um, ending. So I, I, I know about who, what, when, where, why, and how, but I think that something that sticks in your mind, some story that sticks in your mind is lasts a bit longer. And as I said earlier, uh, John Lucas wrote once upon a time, that history is the memory of mankind. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is mm -hmm. where we're going. At least that's where the literature people go. Well, you might then want to import Augustine's cautions about memory. He's <laughs> <laughs> uh, particularly fond of the bit about I know it's in here somewhere. <laughs> the attics of the great house of memory. We have time for about two more questions. All the way in the back. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to pick up. Is it, is it the case that the Augustinian principles of historiography that you've articulated, would, would they preclude the writing of historiography? Or would that be an exception to those principles of Writing history. I mean, you can write like a historian and historians disagree. They have not got an authoritative account. How could they? But you could think it well, yes. Go on <coughs> writing and arguing with your fellow historians. Then suppose you have necessarily got it right. But I, I think what I what I mean is uh, I didn't ask it well that on the principles that that you've outlined for Augustine, one of the issues with writing history is that you don't know how things have actually turned <coughs> out. Yeah. Because the body of Christ is a is a mixed body. Mm -hmm. But in the case of saints, you know on the authority of the church the conclusion of, of the life. You know the authentic and so, can you write hagiography and still be true? Uh -huh. If you have the confidence that the church, the church, not I suppose in Augustinian terms the institutional church, but the blessed company of all faithful people, if you have that confidence that the church can discern the sainthood, that could be contested. Yes. I mean, if you look at some of the examples of sainthood presented to us from the early centuries, Jerome comes to mind. But I, I, I'm prejudiced about Jerome. But the most <laughs> obvious examples how to make it An impressive scholar. There used to be quite a lot of them around in the world of classics. They rather like Jerome. Um, <laughs> but the models of sanctity could be yes. And in the case of, I think about this this morning, uh, some of the early hagiographies, even Jerome will admit, this is really quite disputed territory. So you might want to be a little careful. Sure. <coughs> uh, you're... 
comments a little bit earlier, you made a comment of this uh, grand narrative, and that we don't have grand narratives anymore. And that got me thinking about Elizabeth Clark's book, you know, his, History Theory Text. Ah, oh, right. And um, when I read that, I was thinking to myself, you know, she's, she's writing a grand narrative, you know, about how that grand narrative in history was killed. Yes. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the book, she provides these you know, few different theori theoretical mm. approaches that can help us engage our historical sources. Mm. And I'm just curious, you know, like what, what are some of your thoughts on that? Because now it, it seems like over the last several years, there have been so many different theoretical approaches. Mm. And one of my suspicions <coughs> is, is that sometimes they can actually do a little bit of injustice to the writers, the the texts that we're looking at. Um, so it's, I'm ambivalent about that relationship, even though I'm using one in my dissertation. I just, um, so it's a, I mean, it's, I don't know what to do exactly about it and to kind of think about, because, you know, certainly that old traditional model of that German school of, you know, finding out history as it actually happened is <laughs> probably not uh, doable, mm -hmm. but. Um, I'm also just kind of suspicious about some of the other theoretical models mm -hmm. that are going out now. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm English. I'm always suspicious of theoretical models. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, with all respect to the greater Clark, who is wonderful and yeah. can see the point of them mm -hmm. and try them out. But I suppose that's the answer. I think they are inspirational or at least worth a try mm -hmm. as an approach see what it highlights that you might not otherwise mm -hmm. have done. Um, beyond that, I don't know, what, what are you planning to use in the dissertation? Which approach? Oh, so I'm reading Origins, mm -hmm. a newly found collection of psalm homilies, uh -huh. and I'm looking at how he's exegeting the text in the midst of the struggles facing his third century church in Caesarea. Mm -hmm. And I'm applying Brian Stock's notion of textual communities oh, right. to this. Yes. Um, yeah. I find it to be a model that doesn't have much political baggage to it, mm -hmm. um, but I also think it can be quite insightful uh, for looking at how texts and communities interrelate. But still, I, um, I'm just a little reluctant to just throw it on there and say, yeah, this is a cool thing, so it's going to work. I mean, it's, <laughs> That seems to be entirely legitimate. It looks like an interesting theory. You try it out, you keep alert to the things where it doesn't actually fit. And my Bristol colleagues, who are very much given to the use of theory, at mm -hmm. least in literary criticism, would speak of somebody gesturing mm -hmm. towards a theory. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to do just that, yeah. but you do yeah. want to stay alert to... Mm -hmm. Perhaps that... Cautionary note is a fitting place for us to end. Please join me in thanking. You.